Well, firstly, I would like to thank Keith and the board for asking me to speak today. Um, also, Olivia, very, um, very kind and very um, generous words. Um, I am um, particularly honoured um, to be delivering this lecture tonight as the first future retinal surgeon to be asked to deliver this lecture. And um, also because I had the great um, pleasure of working with Prof as we knew him um, prior to his retirement from the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. So I, I look forward to um, introducing you to Jared William Crock. So we're all aware that um, Prof was the first um, professor of ophthalmology at the University of Melbourne. Uh, he was born in Perth and was a twin. He and his twin, Harry, were um, educated uh, in Perth at the St. Louis Jesuit School. Interestingly, they completed two years of dentistry prior to transferring to the University of Melbourne and um, then commencing medicine. So after completing medicine, Prof travelled to Moorfields and uh, studied there, completing ophthalmology, and then on to Johns Hopkins uh, in Baltimore. In 1963, he returned to Melbourne to become the first professor of ophthalmology in Melbourne. Sorry, I didn't mean to um, flip that forward. Um, Certainly then, he became uh, the leader of the retinal unit um, at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. And at that stage, of course, subspecialties were only just beginning, and so that he was the first uh, leader of the retinal unit. Um, we all know about the fact that he was a twin, but I'm not sure that everyone realised just exactly how alike the twins were. And I wanted to relate um, a story to you told by my colleague, Rob Buttery. He was at a meeting. And um, he saw Prof and he saw a spare seat next to Prof. So he went and uh, sat next to him. He noticed that Prof wasn't sitting with Jackie uh, and said, hello, Prof. Harry turned to him and said, I'm not Prof, I'm Harry. <laughs> but I want to proceed on. Prof was not only the um, first professor, but he established um, the registrar training program at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. He was a renowned clinician and surgeon. And it's interesting that his surgical innovations were, were amazing. He, in, he invented devices not only for retinal surgery, but also for corneal surgery. And I, this is one that has always intrigued me. It's the fasciolata rack. And it, this is a, an instrument that was used to harvest tissue from the thigh, and that tissue was then prepared to wrap around the eye to repair a retinal detachment. So that in those days, not only did patients with retinal detachment have a sore eye, they also went home with a sore leg as well. <laughs> but uh, in addition to this, he was both internationally and nationally famous as a researcher, teacher and collaborator. And a measure of this recognition was that he was invited to present the Robert Doyne Memorial Lecture at the Oxford Ophthalmological Congress in 1970. And he presented this on stereo technology in medicine. He was one of only four Australians who have been asked to deliver this lecture. Now, Two of the others are from Melbourne. That is Professor Hugh Taylor and Associate Professor Alan McNabb, who then they've had this honour also. I've always liked this portrait. I like um, the expression on his face. I, I, I remember that expression. And he's also wearing his most enduring legacy, his comedo, his beloved comedo. That is the combined operating magnifiers and miniature indirect ophthalmoscope, a device that we use to examine the eye and to repair retinal detachments during surgery. And this is the current members of the Vitreo Retinal Unit at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital, and they are wearing their beloved comedos. So this is indeed an enduring legacy, and it's still the best indirect ophthalmoscope in the world. You'll notice that uh, there are only two, two women in the photo, Rosie Dawkins and myself. 
So that as uh, Olivia mentioned, when I started my uh, vitreoretinal training, um, there were no uh, female vitreoretinal surgeons in London. And I trained with um, Christina Flaxel. She was the only other female VR fellow at the time, and she returned to work in the US. There was one female vitreoretinal surgeon um, in the United Kingdom at the time. So why, um, why is this so? Because, uh, as Olivia mentioned, a lot of the work is um, emergency and semi-emergency work. Um, we are working on uh, the retina, uh, the new, neural tissue in the back of the eye, and the vitreous, the jelly material between the lens which supports the retina. A lot of these, um, a lot of the problems that affect the retina are emergencies such as retinal detachments and trauma and surgical complications. And it was just felt that this was uh, not a uh, very family friendly area. However, Vitro-retinal surgery has progressed enormously over the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, there have been enormous strides made in uh, technology, smaller wounds, less invasive surgery, and uh, this has meant much better outcomes for our patients. And in fact, ophthalmology has reflected this as well. We've had enormous advances in drug development and drug delivery, and we've also become aware of the importance of genetics in eye disease. I wanted to show you um, this slide, which show, shows the causes of blindness in working age adults. Previously, this was diabetes, but due to the uh, great progress in ophthalmology, then diabetic blindness has been reduced. And now hereditary retinal disorder disorders are the main causes of blindness during working age adults. So what do we mean by hereditary retinal disorders? What is this condition, retinitis pigmentosa, that we uh, speak of? Essentially, it is a genetic abnormality within the photoreceptors, the cells that turn light into vision within the retina. These cells progressively die in these patients. They, so they're born with vision, but they progressively lose vision uh, during their life. There are more than 250 genetic mutations that cause these diseases. And hence, the rate of decline and the extent of visual loss uh, varies greatly. But essentially, it starts with difficulties in, uh, dark, in the dark and in night vision, with progressive uh, loss of visual field and tunnel vision, and currently there is no uh, treatment available. So why do we think that we can do something for these patients? Well, we know uh, from patients with RP that have donated their eyes that there is retention of some of the nerve tissue within the retina, despite uh, the loss of photoreceptors. And um, on the right here, I have um, OCT images, so cross-sectional images um, of the retina. And we can see in this, even though the photoreceptors have uh, degenerated, there is still neural tissue remaining. And it is the idea of stimulating that residual neural tissue um, that may produce some visual impulses that we call phosphenes that is the basic idea behind the development of a bionic eye. So a bionic eye is a device, a visual prosthesis that is placed within the eye uh, in various different locations, but the basic theory behind it is that electrical or light energy will be used to stimulate the device and stimulate that residual neural tissue to generate visual impulses. And in this image, we have just a, a plan of what these devices can look like. A camera on glasses which capture an image. The, those images are transferred to an external vision processing unit. That vision processing unit translates the images into data, which then passes into the implanted receiver. The data is then passed to the array within the eye, which stimulates this residual neural tissue, and those impulses pass back 
to the visual part of the brain. So how did this um, journey to an Australian bionic eye commence? Well, originally, Professor Hugh Taylor asked Mark McComb and myself to collaborate with Associate Professor Greg Swanning and Professor Nigel Lovell at the University of New South Wales, developing a surgical approach for a retinal prosthesis that they were developing. They were also collaborating with a group in South Korea and were exploring the idea of a suprachoroidal approach, that is, implanting the array between the choroid, the blood vessel layer beneath the retina, and the wall of the eye. It's fair to say that initially Mark and I were a little bit dubious about this approach. However, we commenced travelling to Sydney and started the collaborative work. However, in 2008, at the 2020 summit, the long-term National Health Strategy Group decided that the development of a bionic eye was an aspirational goal for Australia, and funding was allocated to the Australian Research Council for this purpose. Bionic Vision Australia was a collaboration between the Centre for Eye Research Australia, the Bionics Institute, the University of New South Wales, the University of Melbourne and National ICT Australia, with some additional partners. The plan was to bring the University of New South Wales device to clinical trial and do preliminary development work on the University of Melbourne nanocrystalline diamond epiretinal device. The Centre for Eye Research Australia's role was to collaborate with the Bionics Institute uh, in developing surgical strategies, but also uh, to develop uh, a database and run a clinical trial. However, it became apparent that the University of New South Wales device was not going to be suitable for human implantation, and so further development work was required. Professor Rob Shepherd from the Bionics Institute was the perfect person to lead the preclinical team. He had extensive experience in developing cochlear implants and extensive experience in device development. So as I mentioned, the Centre for Eye Research Australia collaborated with the team from the Bionics Institute in developing surgical strategies and proof of concept and safety studies. Professor Robin Geimer, whose extensive clinical trial experience was perfect also for the lead of the clinical group. And Robin's team identified suitable patients for a database, evaluated those patients, and then uh, that aided the patient selection for uh, a presumed clinical trial and the running of that clinic clinical trial. So, the surgical development under Professor Rob Shepherd was driven by Associate Professor Chris Williams. And you can see Mark McComb and myself here in the lab doing some work with Chris. We had come round to the attraction of the suprachoroidal approach, particularly the simplicity and the ease of the surgery. You can see here on the left, the position of our device. It's actually beneath the retina. You can see also here some iterations of the devices um, that we uh, use to develop the footprint and the form of the device that went into the prototype clinical trial. However, we had to prove to ourselves prior to submitting to ethics that our device could be robust and it could withstand the constant movement of the eye. So on the left, you can see um, some of the images of the testing that we did on the bench to uh, determine you know, how much force it would take to essentially destroy these devices. We wanted to know that we could implant it surgically and that the device would still be functional. On the right, you can see our lead testing rig set up in the Bionics Institute, the so-called skulls in the cupboard. And here we have plastic skulls, plastic eyes with leads sutured to them. And of course, the, um, the, the eyes are constantly moving over 24 hours, doing what we call saccades, which are rapid and, and slow eye movements. And um, we were able to generate more than 20 years of lead fatigue data with no breakages. 
but to progress to having a safe device and a safe surgical procedure, then we need to do development work in cadavers. Individuals donate their bodies for scientific research, and we know that medical students use them for dissection and learn anatomy from these cadavers. However, surgical procedures are trialled in cadavers as well. I'd like to think that these individuals would be pleased with our device and the work that we've done, and we're grateful, obviously, to them. Here's the team, the cadaver team, a photograph after uh, one of our Saturday uh, morning uh, sessions. Now, the work at the anatomy school in, uh, at the University of Melbourne was done with the collaboration of Rob Briggs, ENT surgeon. Rob has extensive experience in cochlear implants and external connectors for cochlear implants. And when we were developing our prototype device, we realised that we would need an external connector for these patients because we didn't know what level of stimulation would be required. And it was decided that the prototype device would be a device that was used in the lab. So Rob worked up the entire surgical procedure with us uh, in the cadavers, and we developed new instrumentation. You can see one of the trocars here developed by Owen Burns from the Bionics Institute. And this is a, uh, an instrument that we use to protect the electrode array as we are inserting it. In addition to this, we had um, the nursing staff from theatre at the Royal Victorian Iron Ear Hospital accompany us um, to the anatomy school so that we could step out the layout for theatre and work out nursing and anaesthetic plans. The human cadaver eye studies helped us to develop some specific um, points of our device, particularly um, the exit of the lead from the eye. We were very focused on the lead uh, being uh, low profile and being very stable at, it ex at its exit from the eye. We thought this was vital for safety and stability and for patient safety long term. On the left, you can see one of our publications written by Alexia Saunders from the Bionics Institute detailing some of um, the surgical strategy work that we, um, that we developed during this time. However, we still needed to determine whether the approach would work in live human tissue. And we needed to know whether the surgical approach could be translated to human live patients. We told our oculoplastic colleagues that we were interested in pilot surgery in a patient who was undergoing an enucleation, that is a removal of the eye. One of our oculoplastic colleagues contacted us and said that uh, they had a patient who was undergoing a bilateral enucleation and that this patient had offered to do something for science. I rang her and explained the plan and said that it would add some considerable time to her surgery. She said that not to worry, she was gonna be asleep and that she'd just sleep for a bit longer. <laughs> so we proceeded to insert dummy devices into each eye. And this is the uh, histology actually from um, that surgery. We can see that uh, in fact, the dummy device did go in to the suprachoroidal space. This was a huge step for us and we were very grateful for her help. At this stage, we had collected and published more preclinical data than any other bionic eye group in the world. So with this slide, I, I'm, what I'm trying to convey is that there are all these areas of work that need to be completed to the satisfaction of the surgical and the clinical team to be confident that we have a device that is robust, that is going to be stable and is likely to be efficacious before we apply to the Human Research and Ethics Committee to commence a trial. And so this, this is our prototype trial run between 2012 and 2014. This was a proof of concept study and the patients who entered this study took a leap of faith, not knowing that we, whether the device would work at all, whether they would have any positive outcomes, and they knew that they had an external connector that would need to be removed and so that this was not a permanent option for them. 
So up on the right, we have Lauren Ayton, our clinical coordinator for the prototype study. Uh, we also have our device there, and it was platinum and silicon uh, made of uh, biocompatible materials and placed within the suprachoroidal space. And below that, we have our three patients who uh, were wonderful and we are eternally grateful to them. So I'm often asked whether I was nervous at the time of the first surgery. But I actually wasn't really that nervous about the surgery. I felt that we'd done everything to prepare ourselves. I was actually quite nervous at the last cadaver. And that seems a bit crazy, really, but I was. But by the time we got to the human surgery, I actually was, um, I thought we were, we were all prepared. However, on switch on day, I kept thinking of a conversation that I'd had with a German colleague, a German surgeon, who'd actually come to Australia to speak um, at a bionics conference. And we had a glass of wine together in the bar after the conference, as you do. <laughs> and um, he said to me, you know, your approach will never work. <laughs> and it's a little bit hard to know what to say to that, really. Um, <laughs> however, um, I said, well, obviously, if we didn't think it would work, we wouldn't be doing it. But anyway, what did happen with our trial? Well, actually, we had a successful trial. All patients um, had reliable phosphines, flashes of light, the surgery was safe, and the devices were stable. All three patients underwent successful visual rehabilitation, showing an improvement in their navigational abilities and activities of daily living. And on the slide here, I've just got a demonstration of the stability of the devices from uh, Lauren's paper. Um, the IR images from the OCTs, uh, X-rays, and a um, 3D CD recon a, a CT reconstruction demonstrating um, the lead. So this. So that was one of our patients from the prototype trial, and that was Nick Barnes, our collaborator from NICTA and ANU. And this is the reason that we felt that our results justified further work. So we proceeded to design a next generation device. And we used the feedback and the data that we had from the prototype trial. Obviously, um, because we changed the form and the footprint of the um, device, then we needed to repeat all of the safety data. And it was those changes in the number of electrodes, the wider visual field coverage, um, that altered the mechanical properties of the device. However, we wanted to have more phosphines and increased dynamic range, and we wanted to alter the way the stimulation um, was delivered. So after the safety work was developed, we came up with this, our second generation device, once again placed in the suprachoroidal space uh, with our uh, vision processing unit here, the camera on the glasses, and in the middle here, we can see the array placed within the eye. 
So the point of this is that the patients can use the device after training at home. So we got the surgical team uh, back together along with the great cooperation from the Royal Victorian Iron Ear Hospital and implanted four patients in our second generation trial. All implantations went well. They took three to four hours. Uh, we had no um, adverse events intraoperatively and the devices were fully functional at the end of the surgery. I wanted to show you a collection of clinical images for the current patients. The devices are all stable. And we have some wide field images up here, colour photos of the patients with the device that you can just see, infrared images here, and down below an OCT with a slice. So this is a cross-sectional image of the device sitting in the suprachoroidal space. And we've also got an X-ray uh, with the device sitting um, within the eye. However, the surgery is just the first step. These patients have had no useful vision for more than 15 years, so they need to learn to interpret these flashes of light or phosphenes that they, the stimulation provides. And here they are in the lab working hard under the guidance of Matt Pito our psychophysics lead investigator from the Bionics Institute with his team, Sam and Jess, below. So when the training starts, um, thresholds need to be determined for every uh, electrode on the device and we need to generate a map of the phosphenes of the visual impulses that are stimulated. The patients then undergo various testing within the lab and I've just got a couple of examples there, um, square localization above, moving bar below and so it's a matter of identifying where the square is on the computer screen, the moving bar can move vertically or horizontally and it different speeds and the um, patients um, identify that for us. So what can we say about our clinical trial? The patients are in the middle of this um, at the moment and undergoing um, three monthly uh, testing of activities of daily living and orientation and mobility. So we can tell you that they perform consistently better with device on compared to device off um, in our lab testing, such as tabletop search and door detection. And on the right, you can see a loop of uh, one of the patients doing our door detection test. So what, what have our patients said about participation um, in the trial? I did some laundry separation to get more experience. It was very good. The kids said, excellent. I'm training more on clothes and wardrobe so I can get better at finding my own clothes. The next one is from the ground floor looking up. The first floor is like a veranda where you can see people walking around. I've been in this shopping centre nearly 26 years and I never knew this. Picked up on a lot of different things such as the pylons that support the building and was able to note things in shop windows. I couldn't really tell what they were, but to me at least there was an awareness that there was something in those shop windows, something I'm not aware of with my natural eyes. I was sitting in a cafe, scanning around to see what I could pick up. I found myself observing people and tracking them. Where were they going? Did they walk past me or did they turn and go into another store? To some people this may seem like a trivial thing, but I found it fascinating. The next example is a video of mobility training uh, out and about. You can see um, our participant is wearing the backpack so that we can um, facilitate the videoing. But you can see that it's not her stick that uh, helps her to pause prior uh, to running into the young mum with the children is she's using the device to um, scan in front of her. So what does the future hold? Well, this is an example of the first photograph ever taken. It's an image of a view from an upstairs window. The image is clearly 
nothing like the digital images that we're accustomed to seeing. We have the best vision processing support from Nick Barnes at ANU, and we, also, and we have already started testing new algorithms um, for vision processing in our patients. So we believe that there will be improvements in resolution for the patients. However, what else can we do? We clearly need to intervene earlier to prevent visual loss in patients with inherited retinal disease. Our device for vision restoration is at the stage where patients have irreversible damage. We need to try to slow cell death and prevent vision loss. So intervene at an earlier stage. There's accumulating evidence that low level electrical stimulation of the retina is neuroprotective. That is, it will delay cell loss due to these inherited retinal diseases. We believe that it activates cells, supporting cells within the retina, and leads to an increase in growth factors and a decrease in inflammatory factors, which cause progressive uh, cell loss. So we're working in this area to develop devices to potentially do this. What else is happening in CIRA to intervene in inherited retinal disease? Well, Dr. Ray Wong is mapping the genetic profile of cells within the retina. If we're able to know the genetic profile of healthy cells, then we can start to understand what is going wrong in inherited retinal disease. And Ray's work is collaborative and he collaborates with people internationally. And, you know, this is another great um, step forward for inher inherited retinal disease. What about other options? We often hear about gene and cell therapy. So what, what is gene therapy? Professor Keith Martin, our director, is working on gene therapy for solutions to uh, glaucoma and end-stage visual loss due to glaucoma. Well, it can be attempting to correct a defective gene, or it can be identifying a protective gene and supplementing that to uh, aid um, patients. But cell therapy can um, also be used eventually at some stage um, with cells from either donors or the patient's own cells. And so we have groups working in CIRA on this. In particular, Dr Tom Edwards is working on a first in human clinical trial for an inherited retinal disease called Bietti's crystalline dystrophy. He has a goal of completing preclinical studies and then moving into a first in human retinal gene therapy in Melbourne. So I think to conclude, I believe that the future for inherited retinal disease is improving and we at CIRA are contributing greatly to this. We're working on further developments um, on the, our bionic eye and we're developing a, a database for all patients with inherited retinal disease. And you can see our um, registration uh, logo here. Um, we want to be able to identify all patients with inherited retinal disease um, in this area. And so by knowing more about these patients, by knowing their genetic profile, we can then offer them uh, new trials and new treatments as they become available whether that be neuroprotection, whether that be gene or cell therapy. But all of these uh, aims are to make these diseases treatable rather than untreatable and to improve outcomes for our patients. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge our patients, all seven of them. Our first three patients who took the great leap of faith who uh, really didn't know whether there would be any results from the trial at all. Our second four patients who are continuing to work hard in the middle of um, a really rigorous um, clinical trial. And they do work very hard and we really appreciate their work. And as Keith has mentioned, they're part of our research team. I need to acknowledge our funding. 
On the left, um, the Australian Research Council Special Research Initiative into Bionic Vision Science and Technology to Bionic Vision Australia and the Victorian Government infrastructure support that was so vital for Bionic Vision Australia and to enable us to get our prototype uh, clinical trial going. On the right, uh, the National Health and Medical Research Council grant that we received, once again, Victorian Government infrastructure support and also um, support from Bionic Vision Technology, which enabled us to proceed into our second generation device trial. And I need to acknowledge our study personnel. It, it's obvious that this is a huge collaboration and it's gone on for 10 years. Uh, but these are the, the key people that have enabled us to get to our second generation trial. On the top, on the left side, is the clinicians. Number one at the top is Jonathan Yeo. Johnny and I have done all the surgery um, from the eye point of view together. When you do a new, um, a new surgical procedure, you need people in theatre who are calm, and Johnny is calm, and I uh, would not have been able to do this with him. Secondly, Mark McComb, who started doing uh, all the uh, development work with me originally and has remained a great supporter of all of our work. All of the members of the vitro-retinal unit at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital have been a great support, but in particular Rob, Daniel and Rosie have been a great sounding board for various, you know, issues and problems that we've discussed. Associate Professor Rob Briggs, who right from the very start when we asked him would he be interested in doing this, has been uh, locked in and worked tirelessly with us, not only, um, you know, in the anatomy school but in theatre through all both of our trials. The next group are the group from BI. And I, I really believe that this has been a fantastically productive collaboration and we love working with the guys from BI. Chris Williams always believed that we could do this and he always believed that our, um, we would be able to develop a safe uh, device and we thank him for that, for that great faith. Dave Nigam, whose passion for safety has been the equal of the surgical and clinical teams, and that's been absolutely vital. Owen, who's worked on instruments and continues to do so to help us with our surgery. Matt Pito, who knows more about visual psychophysics than anyone else in this country, and whose guidance with the patients is uh, invaluable. Sam and Jess, who are his um, close um, collaborators um, in the fitting and training team. The next line is our, our group from Sarah. And she and Carla have been um, steadfast and hardworking since the time of the first trial. Maria and Liz, who look after the patients. Maria is our clinical lead and Liz is her great support. And without their hard work and support of the patients, uh, we wouldn't be able to proceed. Associate Professor Nick Barnes from, uh, is our computer vision lead from ANU. And uh, I truly believe that he is uh, the best person at this work uh, of anyone in the world. And we um, have collaborated with him for a long time now. William, who developed our externals from the University of Melbourne, has also been um, invaluable in this work. And I just wanted to finish with my support team, my family, Charles, Zoe and Eleanor. Thank you so much. <laughs>